and I am the program director for the Norman C. Francis Teacher Residency. I started out this whole residency journal as our state has moved to mandatory residency. That's how we actually got started with developing this, how we got the idea. It all stems from what we knew would be state law and that we had to bring all of our students through. So I started out as a design team member and just kind of fell in the director's seat within the first six months of planning. What I'm going to do is, for those of you who may not know a lot about the program, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we integrate culturally responsive teaching and practices into what we do with residency. Our program is basically the first of its kind. We found some that are similar, but we have not found any that is a partnership between HBCUs and CMOs. And so that's what makes us a little bit different. And our partnership is also a little bit different when we look at other residencies in that they are usually coupled or partnered with one school district or one school or one entity. But we have several here in New Orleans. The landscape of education has changed so much that we have charter schools that are just all over, some autonomous, some have more than one, some are standalones. So it's a very different educational landscape from what we had before Katrina. So we are partnered with 12 different CMOs. When we started this, we set out with a vision. We had a design team, came up with our mission and our vision, and it was basically to prepare diverse community-based teachers with strong pedagogical content knowledge in a residency program that would impact student achievement and also hopefully adding in Xavier's mission to create a more just and humane society. Our mission is to develop highly effective career teachers through a practice-based program that ensures that educators are equipped with what they need to sustain and to stay within the system. So as we start to look at who we recruit, we recruit people who have connections to New Orleans. We're hoping that that would be something that would sustain them or keep them in place to teach for a number of years, to make teaching a lifelong career. We also have a commitment to equity. We know that with all that has happened to education here in New Orleans, some of the things that we see as equity gaps, we want to ensure that our teachers, our residents are prepared to address some of those issues that we are facing. The commitment to our program is four years, one year of residency followed by three years of teaching. It's basically with the same CMO, Charter Management Organization, that they do their residency with. They're not always placed within the same school but they are definitely placed within that same CMO because part of the C grant requires some matching funds to happen. And so CMOs have some buy-in when it comes to their residents. Right now, we have certain competencies that we use when we're going in to observe and to evaluate our residents as they're co-teaching with their resident mentors. And so our competencies, the first one is to operate as professionals with positive mindsets. The second one is to contribute with purpose to professional communities. The third, to create inclusive and demanding cultures in their classroom, to prepare and present meaningful learning experiences, and to execute effective instruction. So this has morphed into these competencies as we've started to transition through the years. We've now come up with these concrete competencies. But before, when we thought about the whole concept initially, we thought of a big umbrella, the umbrella being instructional excellence. And then under that umbrella, we had collaboration, we have content knowledge, we had competence, and we also had culture. So we always know from the beginning that culture was going to be important. And so as we think about culture, or as we talk about culture, it's not always just about like a set culture for a specific group of people. There's a set culture within each CMO, each charter management organization. Then there's another culture within each school. And then if you have never been to New Orleans, then you know that we have a culture here that is just different from many other places. And so even residents who are moving here from somewhere else, getting acclimated to New Orleans culture can also be a big deal. So I'm going to give you a little overview of the components of our program. There are basically six major pillars to our program, coursework, off-site institutes, placement in an effective teacher's classroom, mentorship, cohort support, gateway assessments. Through these particular components, we have not isolated and said, okay, we're going to definitely do culture all along. It is basically integrated into all of these. So for the coursework, they are in an alternative certification program. It's a 36-hour program where they're getting graduate coursework. So they're roughly in graduate school for two years. They can major in elementary, middle, or high school. They can do elementary regular or elementary sped. 
our middle school folk must do a dual certification. So they get middle school and SPAD. And then our high school people can select whatever content and they can also add on SPAD if they'd like. So it just depends. And so we have several different tracks in which they can go through. We also have offsite institutes. Our institutes are monthly trainings. When our residents come to us, we spend time talking, hearing what's happening within their courses. They get to share with the other cohort members, an opportunity for them to network. But it's also an opportunity for us to invest in them, to give them some professional development, to give them some professional tips, just a time for us to bond and get together. With most residencies, their residents are in schools Monday through Thursday, but then they do their institutes on Friday because it also includes their coursework. For our residents, coursework happens in the evening, so there's no need for them to take off every Friday. Placement in an effective teacher's classroom, there's just certain criteria that we ask our CMOs to consider when they're selecting a mentor for the residents to definitely think about their content knowledge, think about the expertise and the effectiveness that they have as a classroom teacher and when they're delivering instruction. And we also ask that they have at least five years of successful teaching experience. The mentorship goes along with the partner. So we do things to make sure that within that mentorship that the mentors are being developed so that they can be good mentors. So some of them may be good teachers, but may not have been mentors before. So we definitely have a mechanism in place so that those mentors can also have an opportunity to grow and become better mentors. One of the things that we've seen across the board with residents across the country is that the bonding is very important. And so it's one of the things that I personally said, you know what, they don't really need the bonding. It's really not that important. But when I started to do these activities with my residents, I found that they were very meaningful and that they matter. So we've tried to get more things in. So like bowling, having like the night where we go out and have appetizers, just setting up like brown bags so that we can actually get together and talk and have some time to do some things outside of education. But it always leads to us ultimately talking about what's happening within education or within their schools. The last thing is gateways. We have gateway assessments. So throughout the residency year, they're just basically little checkpoint assessments where residents have four gateways. Before, we set them up so that they were in isolation, but this time we've kind of grouped them up basically by semesters. Once mentors started to talk about how advantageous it was having someone else, another person in the classroom, that started to spread. Our mentors get paid $2,500 for the year for their residents. They also get paid a little stipend for the summer training. So we offer some summer training that helps prepare them. And then I think another part of this is that we try to make our mentors feel totally supportive. We have two site mentors. Their primary job is to provide direct support to the mental pairs. And we also have an external person, Dr. Elizabeth Rhodes, who has been trained and is basically an expert in like relationship building, co-teaching models. So she does all that. So I think it's the money coupled with the support, coupled with the bang of having someone else in your classroom. And I always try to talk to the mentors and let them know that they are the key. Because if mentorship and what's happening in the classroom is not going well, then our residents are not going to be successful. So we make it a priority to let them know how important their role is. And then to help them get through it, just to let them know like this resident success is based upon you. So when they're doing really, really well, that's not attributed to our team, it's attributed to you because they've spent so much time with you. And we do also do like little incentives, just like dropping off little gifts. So when they come in, we'll give them like little messenger bags, a little ink pens and food also helps sometimes. If a mentor is not really effective and they were just chosen randomly because they were somebody's friend, they had something else in mind, we started to think about how can we make them more effective. And so we put some other mechanisms in place to add to the training that they get to include them into some of the things that we normally wouldn't include them in some of the sessions that we've had for residents. We've invited the mentors to come in. And then for some sessions that we feel would be beneficial to them, we have decided that we would do some isolated things that would help them to not be mixed in with the residents, but to give them some learnings of their own where it's just the mentors. For our cohort sizes, our first cohort, we had 11, but this session, 20. For this cohort that we're recruiting for cohort three, we actually have 30 or 35. The first year, the residents received $25,000, but that full amount wasn't for them. We broke off tuition, we broke off insurance, and then the remaining of that 25 went to them. And residents really struggled, especially folk who were moving here from other places. It was definitely a struggle for them, and we realized the struggle. And so for the first cohort, 
those were really my babies. And so they would call me with stuff. And, you know, like I was Mama Ken. They would call me wanting to talk. We don't have groceries, so we have to figure out ways to just try to help them get through it. But it helped us to better understand that although we know it's something that's needed and we know it's beneficial, we know that we had to pay our residents a little bit more. The resident salary did increase a little bit, and the salary that they get is very comparable to that of a paraprofessional. In some people's mind, they would consider them a paraprofessional or an assistant, but we definitely call them co-teachers, and it's just a stipend to get them through. And being that we give them support for tuition, and we also can provide some student health insurance for them, it all makes the package a little bit more beneficial. Some of it is grant funded. With the grant, there's a match. And so the total cost for us to host a resident is 35000 That includes the tuition, the stipend, and the insurance. So it's 35000 And what we do is we ask our CMOs, our charter management folk who want these folks, we ask them to come in and to bring 15000 And that 15000 supplements what we need to pay for their stipends. When the process starts, we start off with not a direct hit of like, are you culturally confident? What do you know about this? We don't hit them with that, but we ask them questions on the initial application that they respond to about, have you worked with children? Have you worked in under-resourced environments? Have you worked in the New Orleans area? Have you been to New Orleans? So we ask them all kinds of questions like that. Like, what are your beliefs about education? What do you know about the educational equity gaps? And so some of this is like, trying to figure out what they know because we know that our residents are not typically education folks. They come from all other fields. So attorneys, we have some people who have like PhDs in research biology, people who were paraprofessionals. So they come from everywhere. And then talk about how does that inspire you to want to become a teacher based upon what you know. And that's just in the initial application. After the initial application, if that goes well based upon the rubric, then they move on to the next round, which is the phone interview. During a phone interview, we don't talk a whole lot about the cultural competence part. We talk more about relationship building and about them being team players and how do they take feedback and tell us about a goal and, you know, some of those kinds of things. But it's still some things to help us figure out just like where do they fit within the whole scheme of what we're looking for as far as a resident. Then in the final interview, we do have it set up where we have questions that are about dedication and persistence, and then questions that are about fit and cultural confidence and cultural awareness. Some of the things we ask them in the in-person interview, we ask them to read an article that's basically about a family that had a traumatic experience during Hurricane Katrina with education, like bullying and being asked to stay home. And then we ask them, what about this article resonated with you? Tell us, how does this make you feel about being an educator in New Orleans? And so listening to some of those responses also helps us. And so they're graded on the rubric. We talk about, was their response acceptable, unsatisfactory? You know, did it meet the need? We also ask them about different biases that they may have and prejudice. And then once they realize them, how did they work to overcome them? We also ask a question about them working with different types of people. Have you ever worked with someone who was different from you in some meaningful way? How did you navigate that relationship? What was the ultimate outcome? What were some of the challenges you faced? What did you learn from that relationship? The final interview really gives us a lot because those questions that I just gave you were like four questions. But then we also ask questions about like, give us the characteristics of you being a great teammate, characteristics of you being a not so great teammate. And then also having them do a lesson plan. So they do prepare a lesson plan for this interview, three minutes. They do the lesson plan, and then we give them feedback. We give them positive and critical and to see how they respond. And so together, holistically, this helps us better understand. When we looked at our first cohort that came in, we had a total of 179 applications. And from those, we made offers to about 35, and we ended up with a cohort of 12. So somewhere along the line, this cultural competence, this cultural awareness came into play somewhere throughout the course of them applying for the residency. When we talked about that whole coursework, institutes, all that, the next part of it is coursework. Our professors, our team is constantly figuring out how do we make this culturally responsive teaching a part of what we do and expose our students to it so that they're ready for what they're going to encounter when they're in the real world. We are an HBCU, so we haven't always been as intentional as we are now about this. So we've always had courses with multicultural education as a course. We've always had some kind of diversity. Diversity has always been a part of our whole division of education's framework. 
But now we basically do several things to try to develop skills that are crucial to them understanding diverse learners. And so through that, we introduce them to several teaching models, and this is throughout the course of their curriculum. They're introduced to research on learning styles, multiple intelligences, emotional intelligences, engineering design, cooperative learning, direct instruction, lecture discussion. So when we look at all of those models, we try to figure out and make sure that they're included across the span of the curriculum of what our students will see. So we also try to figure out where have we looked at these particular practices and where do we introduce them, where do we reinforce them, and where should our students have mastered them. So we kind of like lay it out to try to figure out how can we make sure that they have good awareness of it before they actually exit out into the classroom. We often challenge them to think about how to manage these different diverse learners in ways that are safe and that are culturally compatible. So I want to give you two examples of assignments that we have in two different courses that our residents go through. The first course, classroom management, that all of our residents actually take, and they take this course together. It's also like a bonding activity for them, too, because it's not just the course, but they get to do other things together. This assignment, they read the book Push Out by Monique Morris, and so they are presented with statistics and histories of students who have been invisible in American education. And they're challenged to create safe and nurturing environments for everyone. So they go through this whole discussion. We have questions that guide them into thinking more about the students who have been ignored or who have not been a real part of American education because we know that these are some of the kids that they're going to be working with. And so they go through the discussions. There are some papers that's involved. And then at the end of the course, they are asked to complete a presentation where they have to create some demonstration, some way to advocate for children who have been pushed out of the educational system. And they present to their classmates why they chose this and what do they plan to do to be a change agent in advocating for these particular students that they chose. The presentation is called Ode to the Black Girl. Another assignment happens in a course that they can take anywhere throughout their matriculation. They can take this course, Advanced Educational Psychology, and they were asked to read Dr. Ladson Billings' book, Dream Keepers. And there's a whole bunch of discussion that happens. And I think the most meaningful part is, of course, their papers and essays that they have to write. But they talk about what does culturally responsive teaching look like? What does it sound like? Why is it important? And what keeps teachers from doing it? And what does culturally relevant pedagogy look like in your context? So before they're even exposed to it, tell us what it looks like in your content. How do you plan to address it? Because don't think that it's not going to happen because it will. So let's have a plan for it. So then there's a plan that they have to do that goes along with that. So both of those assignments come from classes that are within everybody's curriculum. Every resident must take classroom management and every resident must take advanced educational psychology. For the monthly institutes, what we do with monthly institutes is that the residents come to us and we are definitely engaged. We get to hear what's happening. They get an opportunity to vent about things that may not have went well. But we also present and prepare case studies, scenarios, tuning protocols, all kinds of things to help us understand what they're going through and then to give them an opportunity to hear how the site mentors might have solved certain situations. So I said that the residents can submit issues, but the mentors can also submit issues. Sometimes we encounter issues where there may be personality conflicts or cultural conflicts between the mentor and the residents, and we definitely do everything we can to proactively help, support, and provide professional development so that they can be better. But the part of the Institute, it allows the practice to lead to discussions that helps our residents to be good judgment makers. And so we often talk about like calls that they'll have to make in order to be good judgment. Like it's not always, let me think about it and there's a right or wrong answer. How do I make a good judgment call in this particular situation with the student that's in the best interest of the student? And so with the institutes, all kinds of case studies, all kinds of scenarios, role playing, tuning protocols that helps them to better hear about this, to get the topics out, and then also a non-threatening environment because their mentors are not there, their students are not there, they're just basically hearing it from the NCFTR team and from their other cohort members. And so when I talked about the other components of all of this, I mentioned placement in an effective classroom teachers, that goes into that because whatever happens with that practice, we try to transfer it over into practice outside of the classroom or discussion outside of the classroom. The mentorship was also another component and we feel that it falls into this part because that's the same thing. If the mentor is struggling with something that they can't come to the resident about and we think that it is beneficial to all residents, 
we bring it into the institute. Also with the cohort support, they're there, they have their little own group meetings, their little FaceTimes that they all do together. They have that support. That cultural piece is definitely included there. And that's a non-threatening environment that they can come and talk and ask any questions. I remember in one of our last institutes, one of our white residents wanted to know if it was okay for her to correct a black student that was saying library. And so then we let the residents, what do you think? We gave them an opportunity to share. What would they do? And then we gave our own perspectives. Absolutely. We want them to get it right. There's a way to do it. And when kids know that you care, they want to be corrected. They ultimately want to get it right. Those kinds of questions come up in institutes. For the last component, those gateways that we talked about, those checkpoints, we have four gateways. The first one deals with communication. And so there's a task and the residents must actually do the task. And for this particular gateway, they have to have 50 conversations across the board with students, parents, other teachers, leaders, custodians, bus drivers. They have to have 50 conversations. And then they have to pick 10 conversations where they either have like a, ah, moment or it's meaningful. And then they have to document that conversation. They have to do some follow-up. We had a resident talk to a parent whose son participates in one of the biggest Black parades here in New Orleans, which is Zulu. And he was a junior Zulu. And so this is the highlight of his year because on this parade route, it's like millions of people out. Everybody's out. Everybody's screaming his name. And his mom is telling the resident how much he loves this and how it's a big deal. So, of course, I'm like, girl, you can use that. What? All throughout the year, you would have a whole year where you can use this to help you. But the parent invited the resident who was not from New Orleans to come to the parade to sit with them. And, of course, New Orleans people, they don't do parades like tourists. It's a whole different setup. So now this turned over a whole new leaf. When the kid saw that his teacher was there and that she didn't know about New Orleans and she got to see him, it just started a whole new connection. And so... In this, they could talk to teachers about other things, like teachers know about workshops that everybody else doesn't. There may be a diversity workshop at the local teachers union building or even at the library. So teachers would share that, and then there may be something that they would follow up on. Leaders could also talk about maybe different professional developments or conferences that they know of that may address differentiation or inclusion. Students often talk about things that happen in their communities that they attend and sometimes invite residents or their co-teachers to attend with them. So that's gateway one. Gateway two is about classroom management. And basically it's a 15 minute classroom observation. The target focus for that observation is classroom management. But we also look for little flags in there that might be where the resident only calls on girls or the resident only stays on one side of the room, or maybe the resident may use negative connotation in their language. So then we definitely address that. It's a part of the rubric and we'll like make little notes and address it and then follow up to make sure that they have done something to rectify that. The third gateway is lesson planning. And so a part of that is knowing your students, knowing who they are, knowing their interests, knowing different aspects of their culture, and then being able to plan a lesson that is effective for all students. So we should see some cultural variance in your lessons. That is important to students. And if we're going to get students to learn, we need to make sure that we include what's important to them. The last gateway is lesson delivery. And so with that delivery, it goes back to those competencies that I told you about earlier that all lead to them being competent of their content, them being competent in delivering the lessons and planning the lessons and classroom management and then the culture that they set. We have some external outreach that helps us help our residents, help our mentors and help our students. So for the mentors, the mentors go through a training The person who leads the training is our consultant, and she consults with us to help us with some of those issues. If there are issues that we face that we need, she consults with us. If there's a really tough and challenging issue that's happening within a school between a mentor and a resident, then we definitely invite her in to come in to help us. She also helps us with those issues, but she helps us to do activities, to plan culturally responsive activities during the mentor sessions and also during our institute sessions with our residents. We also have our seed partners. And with our seed partners, we get together once a month and have discussions about things that are relevant to all of us. But I think every C partner has been very intentional about what we do with culturally responsive pedagogy and teaching. 
And so we get to visit them. So for instance, TNTP invited all the departments to come in to their session in the summer where they were looking at a culturally relevant text and teaching their residents how to modify it. And so whatever we take from them, we can definitely use them as a resource to go back and do that. Some of the other ones that I know that they've done was differentiation of instruction and also lesson plan were some of the ones that we've attended so far. Before Katrina, the United Teachers of New Orleans was very big because we were a district. And now with charter schools and CMOs, we don't necessarily have a large teachers union, but they have a collective called the New Orleans Black Teacher Teaching Collective. And it's not just for black teachers, it's for all teachers. So what they do is they provide lessons for teaching students of color. The lessons were developed by students at the center where they have different folks that come in from the community that engage. A lot of it is centered around like maybe single family homes, incarcerated parents. They do different writing activities and story blocks that all center around things that are maybe happening or crucial to some of our students that would help or would impact the lessons that they would teach. This guy, his name is Matthew Kincaid. He does all of these anti-racism, anti-oppression workshops. And so his whole thing is overcoming racism. And so he's going to come in and provide workshops for our residents. They're going to go through a two-part series with him. But as we were talking to our mentors about what the residents were going to get, one of our mentors said, oh my God, I did his session. It was totally life-changing. So now as a division, we're looking at making sure our mentors are equipped with the same training because some of them had some of the same issues. And one of our mentors in one of our sessions, she said, his session was life-changing. If I could do it again, I would do it again. When she said that, I was like, everybody's doing it. So then when Matthew and I had an opportunity to talk with Dr. Agbar, Dr. Agbar felt like even some of our faculty, not just the Division of Education faculty, but faculty across the board here at Xavier should also get the training. So she's working to set up something so that everybody can start the training because at the end of the day, it starts with us. All of these components, the way we integrate it is not in isolation. We try to get it integrated into our curriculum, into everything that we do. But one of the things is that with our special partnership being an HBCU, for a couple of our residents, their first experience of being on a historically Black campus, being taught by predominantly African-American Black professors, having a being surrounded by a whole classroom of Black students and working with a whole group of Black teachers, even for some of our Black residents. So we are very, very proud of what we're doing, but we are definitely still a work in progress. 